my name is Alex Pennington, and I'm here with top literary agent Mark Gottlieb. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Very kind of you to have me here. Of course. So I really wanted to talk to you about this article you wrote. What was your kind of motivation behind this article? Well, what happened was I, I wanted to write about how, you know, I... I felt how I got the impression that, you know, with a diverse books movement within book publishing, I felt that Jews had been largely left out of the discourse. Not entirely, but their voices could have been much louder. And even given the fact that, yes, there do indeed exist some Jewish books from authors, you know, over many years, but in particular, I wanted people to consider people of, you know, Jewish backgrounds to be diverse. Yes, I, you know, so funny thing, and I, I have to ask, are you Jewish yourself? I, I'm curious. So my last name, Gottlieb, is Jewish. You know, my family, my dad is Jewish, and I grew up in a Jewish town called Scarsdale, New York. So most of my friends and growing up were Jewish. My childhood best friend is a, you know, modern Orthodox Jew. And I just, you know, found it frustrating that the diverse books movement, when it came along, I think it was very well intentioned, but it left a lot of voices out in the process, you know, albeit unintentionally. And I think they've kind of since backpedaled on some things to include more marginalized voices, not just necessarily Jewish people. So a while back, I kind of went through, I guess it was two, three years ago now, I kind of had a, a religious change of heart and I got really interested in why, why why did Judaism not accept Christianity? I was Christian at the time, but was finding some kind of issues with the, the religion. And so I kind of went on this hunt to, to figure that out. Like, okay, so why, why did this group of people not accept this? And I was really shocked to find that there is not much Jewish books on this topic. Right. I right. mean, if I go to a Christian bookstore and want to know why, or any bookstore in the Christian section, why do they accept Jesus or whatever, I'll find hundreds of books on this subject. But it was just amazing, like, this is the building block of this faith. And so where is all this literature? Because something every Christian, and really anyone religious, wants to know is what happened here? Oh, sure. I mean, I think there are a lot of probably historical events, certain kinds of power structures and things like that that went on. And Kind of the more that you kind of dig into this stuff, the more you find there's a lot of commonalities between religions. There's a lot of things that reoccur, for instance, you know, between Christianity and Judaism, you know, on Easter, right? You have an Easter egg hunt. Mm -hmm. On Passover, you go and search for what's called an afikomen, which is basically, it's like a piece of matzo bread. Or it's wrapped in fabric and the kids who find it, they get a prize, you know? Or even in, there's a Persian holiday called Nuruz, which celebrates, you know, springtime, the same way that Easter occurs around the springtime. Mm -hmm. And people paint eggs. You know, I think a lot of this has probably to do with the, the movement of people, the fact that these are Judeo-Christian religions in that, you know, they have their basis in Judaism. You know, Jesus was a Jewish rabbi and he actually went on to become a, he's considered a prophet in the Muslim faith. So mm -hmm. Muslims consider Christians to be, you know, part of their brotherhood. And the, I would say for Jewish people, you know, Christianity was kind of a, like a weird spinoff of Judaism. Like, no, I don't want to say a, a, a cult that spun off of Judaism or anything like that, but it was born of like the, the Old Testament. And a similar thing, I think also happened in Islam in that, you know, if you, if you, if everyone, if they read their Bible, they know this story well, there are two brothers, Isaac and Ishmael, they had a disagreement over, you know, who would inherit the throne because, you know, one of the brothers was born of, you know, a stepmother and they fought, they went to war. Ishmael was driven off into the desert and formed what we all later came to know as the Muslim faith. So the whole interesting thing there is they were, it was all one religion at one point. And, you know, that's why there are so many things that reoccur, you know, between these three major religions. I, have you ever heard of the rabbi Tovia Singer? I'm not sure. So he's the founder of Outreach Judaism. Okay. And I'm actually going to be talking with him next week. But whenever I was really getting into all this stuff, I watched a video on Islam and Judaism. And... 
something really fascinating he brought up was the fact that with Esau, there's actually a prophecy that God is going to multiply his descendants. It's the same prophecy given to, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so one of the things he said is that, you know, when a lot of Jews, they look at Islam, it's not really surprising because the faiths are so similar. I mean, yes, they believe in Jesus, but it's not the Christian Jesus, like the message of Jesus and Islam, of there being one God and all that. It's so compatible, so very similar. Oh, yeah. I mean, for instance, there's a lot of similarities even between being kosher and being halal, you know. Yes. Between, between yeah, that's, is. yeah, it's, you know, just fascinating. I was talking to some Muslims about this. I've been talking to a lot of people about this kind of stuff lately. And that was one of the things they said is that halal, it's so similar. It's like we have even the same kind of moral with certain things and not eating pork. And just, it, it's fascinating. And for me, I found it really sad because one of the things I did is that I asked a lot of Christians at the time when I was in the church, you know, what, what do you guys think of why these people don't believe this? Mm -hmm. And I never got scriptural answers. I always kind of got the, the kind of anti-Semitic remarks of they're just not seeing this and stuff. It's right. like, well, that, that doesn't make much sense or Isaiah 53. There are some practical reasons for a lot of these things. I mean, you know, I don't know if this is too much of a tangent for you, you know, as to Jews and their place, you know, in the book publishing landscape. But really that all, a lot of this stuff came about for practical reasons. I talk about it in the blog article I wrote a little bit. You know, Judaism is an ethnocentric religion mm -hmm. on the one hand. So because they didn't have DNA tests back then, it was important that the mother be Jewish in order to prove that someone witnessed a Jewish birth. You know, the thing as to Jews not eating shellfish or not eating pork, there are practical reasons for this. You know, a good example is they, you know, in an archaeological sites in coastal cities and caves where, you know, ancient Jews used to live, they discovered shells from shellfish in these caves. And so clearly people, you know, even living there in the desert were, they were, at one point, they were probably ancient Jews who were eating shellfish. But as they moved farther and farther into the desert, and it was harder to keep fish like that fresh, or if you ran a risk of, you know, like with pork, if you don't cook pork fully, you know, you run certain health risks. It kind of found its way, it worked its way into the religion. There were just external historical impacts on the Jewish religion. The whole thing with, for instance, like Jews not, you know, observing the Sabbath and not working mm -hmm. on the Sabbath, a lot of that was a product of, on the one hand, people trying to kind of separate themselves from other people, you know, make themselves kind of distinct and uniquely their own. But at the same time, in the medieval world, Jews were forced to be money lenders and collect debts. And when things went wrong, Jews were often, you know, blamed, scapegoated for these kinds of things. And one of the reasons why Jews were made to be money lenders was because the Christian faith kind of had rallied against things like, well, not just gambling, but touching money or, you know, on Sundays and holy days, yeah. whereas Jews observed a different day. So mm -hmm. a lot of these things just happened over long periods of time. Even, you know, why very religious, uh, I mean, I'm not at all, I would say I'm probably not at all religious, but I'd say very religious Jewish women, you know, who cover their heads, you know, the, the historical implication of that is that, again, in medieval Europe, the king and the nobles had the right to, if they wanted, to sleep with a Jewish bride on her wedding night. And it was a way to kind of cleanse the population, really, of, of Jewish people. It was really unfortunate. So in order to make women unappealing to these British and European noblemen who were practicing this kind of thing, uh, the women would shave their heads to you know, look, look more boyish or manlike yeah. and, and then cover their heads with a headscarf. And it, it carried through into the religion kind of like as an aesthetic among very, very religious, you know, Orthodox, Hasidic Jewish women. That same with Islam. And, you know, one, there's a big stigma against that, I feel like in America, especially for some, for, I'm not even sure why, because like I've talked to Muslims and, and Jewish women who do that and they, they like it. That just, you know, kind of part of the culture they're brought up in. Well, it's their freedom, you know, and if it honestly, if it's not harming someone else, if it's mm -hmm. not really, truly 
encroaching on someone else's freedom, you know, it's a choice. And there's always a big debate over, well, do these people know better or not? Are they really being, are they captives, you know, in their own religion? But there's a lot of practical reasons to it. Like I was watching this episode of Anthony Bourdain when his show was still around on CNN. He went to uh, like a Muslim fast food restaurant he was in, I think either Afghanistan or a country like, and there were three separate entrances to the restaurant and three separate sections. There was one for just men, uh, excuse me, two separate entrances, one for just men and one for women, children, and family. So as a man, you could only go, you know, into that portion of the restaurant if you were married. And he was sort of shocked and appalled and, you know, asked this woman who was his tour guide, who was obviously wearing like a headdress and all this stuff, how could this be? This doesn't seem right. You know, it separates the sexes. And her attitude was, well, we do this to protect women because men can behave like dogs sometimes. And yeah. that's like how their idea of protecting the fairer sex. I've always found it fascinating how, especially with like, like with sex like that, how different cultures really do view it. I, you know, I love comparative mythology and religions. And that is especially like in the Middle East, that has been such an important part of it. And often, even though we look at today like that, you know, we say that's not really a good thing. It's like there are practical reasons why they did this that were usually based in very good ideas. Yeah. I mean, religion was really the first system of law and governance before, you know, we had government as we know it today. And so people who couldn't really otherwise like go to school, get an education, function within a society that, you know, had rules and laws and implications for breaking these laws and rules, you know, religion served a lot of these purposes. Like certainly, in, you know, in the ancient world, it, it kept, you know, society and, and the fabric of society together in an otherwise very, very lawless world. I mean, you go farther back, you go in history, the more, you know, kind of outrageous you see the world was before, you know, things like religion came into place. So there were, there were really just practical reasons for a lot of this stuff. I feel like that's one of the biggest differences between the world today and the past. Like, it doesn't matter what country you looked at in the kind of primitive world, they all had their religions, but it was basically that was the law. Why do you obey this law? Because that's what our God said we should do. That's the Torah, Islam has it, even, you know, Native American religions here. There's always this cultural morality. Whereas today, we, you know, with atheism, and stuff we don't really have that or need that almost yeah i mean i think a lot of this began in the story and oral tradition of you know the only way you could tell kids not to eat the poison berries were <laughs> sometimes if you put it into a story and then the stories got passed down generation to generation then they got written down and then it yeah it became a tradition it became practiced so much that it you know works its way into you know like some kind of a dogma or a religion and you know that's kind of how we end up with a lot of this stuff and then it's very hard in certain places to separate church and state you know like for instance in saudi arabia they have religious police you know my girlfriend mm -hmm. for instance she's korean and she was a nurse in saudi arabia doing pediatric oncology for two years and then she was in a shopping mall one time and she was putting lipstick on because they had makeup testers and for women in the mall and a member of the religious police came up to her and you know waved his finger at her and said no you can't do that please put your, you know, headscarf yeah. back on. But, you know, and the reason why we're, again, why we arrive at that kind of stuff is because it was, it was just, it's still very hard as it was back then to separate church and state because mm -hmm. the state relied so much on the church yeah. for governments, you know? So I don't know, it's really hard to say, but I think that's kind of, none of this is like really my opinion. It's just what I, what it, I see, what I perceive. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's so true though. I mean, look at England for example, or even America, they were so kind of tied to the church like that. And you see this, well, in the Middle East with the rise of Islam, they have the, the government in church, well, not church, but religion are very hand in hand with one another. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of this has to do with just, I've, certainly we didn't have TV, radio, the internet, any of that, you know, pe no. that was sort of people's main source of information and understanding and a way to unify people. And, you know, it makes sense, you know, when you kind of boil it down, it's hard to, to see or, 
or imagine what will happen like today with the way the world mm -hmm. is and the way, you know, information travels and whether or not there's, you know, a need for a lot of this stuff or at least in the way in which it was previously understood. I suppose that's why you have like so many different, like for instance, in Judaism, there are, you know, if you're very, very religious, like a Roman Catholic might be, you know, you're probably like an uh, Orthodox or Hasidic Jew and kind of beneath yeah. that is modern Orthodox. And after that, you know, again, a little less religious is, you know, conservative Jews, and then you have reformed Jews. So, you know, that's probably one of the reasons why that stuff comes about. Uh, I think, you know, so I, I'm, I write, I'm a white writer, and I use pull from law of Judaism, but I've been, I've been looking at like the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Zohar. I just, it's such a rich culture and it expands on these stories and goes into such great detail about them. Well, I think that has to do with it just goes back to the movement of people. I was at an exhibit once and I was, I talked about this a little bit in the, the blog article I had, had written uh, for my site, but I had learned that like, for instance, in, in ancient Egypt, like before, before, you know, the Jews and were really kind of written into history. King Tut's father tried to enact monotheism in Egypt to kind of simplify the religion, to begin to dissolve some of the power of, you know, the priesthood because you had various temples, various gods. And he wanted to just kind of boil it all down to sort of the, the sun god Ra. And, you know, it was gonna, going to be called, I can't pronounce this, Akhenatonism or something like that. There was a priest who, you know, was gonna be almost like a de facto priest in this area. And, you know, the Pharaoh would only almost be treated like a god like it's it's not all that different from what we have today like in this country we have we have a president who's you know and I, I don't want to say supremely powerful but pretty you powerful know, pretty powerful certainly throughout the world and it centralizes a lot of aspects of government and then you know we're a monotheistic in this country for the most part mm -hmm. you know there are monotheistic religions among christians jews and muslims but what happened was the priesthood in ancient Egypt wasn't having it. People are never having it when their their power is threatened. It's one of the reasons why, you know, Jesus was uh, probably ended up on, on the cross. He was such mm -hmm. a threat to not only the Romans, but the Jewish establishment. And this pharaoh was assassinated oh, wow. uh -huh. his son king tut tried to bring this religion back when he came to power was also assassinated and this priest with his monotheistic followers were driven out of africa you know northern egypt back then there was a land bridge and they were driven into the desert now there's no like they always say there's no whenever people say well jews were enslaved they built the pyramids in egypt people always argue there's no real archaeological evidence or there's no history that shows the Jews were ever really in Egypt and actually built the pyramid other than what's written, you know, in the Bible and, you know, the story of Moses. But a lot of people argue that perhaps this priest who, you know, with his followers, you know, they conceived of monotheism and wanted for that and were driven out of Egypt the same way Moses led his people out of Egypt. And, you know, did, did Moses actually part the Red Sea. Well, back then there was a land bridge where you could walk probably across, you know, between the Red Sea from Northern Africa into other parts of the Middle East. It's it's possible, you know, that Jews could trace their history back to Egypt in that way. But You're blowing my mind right now. This is fascinating. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. But that's why I say like there are all these kinds of reoccurrences between religions. And I think people, you know, who spend too much time, you know focusing on everyone's differences and what's wrong with the other person and this and that mm -hmm. when you get down to it you know we all kind of come from the same place and there's so much that ties us together so many commonalities and it's it's because of the stuff that yeah i was inspired to write that article i thought that you know when the diverse we need diverse books came along as a movement in book publishing because there was a big lack of diversity in publishing both in terms of people who worked in publishing and the books which were being published and you know suddenly what happened was there was sort of this uh, awkward effect from this we had a big influx of diverse books which is great but they weren't always written by people of that background and so a lot of people who who, for instance, had lived a certain kind of experience, like, you know, maybe, maybe they were there. Let's uh, just to use a random example. 
let's say they're African American, but they were very upset to see someone who is not African American write about you know the experience of, you know of slavery. They would feel you know disenfranchised in a way and feel like their narrative was being misrepresented and taken taken away from them. So in response to this, you know all these publishers began having to cancel publications because the social media mob erupted. These we need diverse books people kind of came out of the woodwork again and said, well, it can't just be we need diverse books. Now it needs to be own voices, which basically means people can only tell their own narratives, which I understand. For instance, you know, on the one hand, I felt like, and you may agree with me or not, uh, you probably saw the movie Schindler's List. Yes. Uh, Steven Spielberg movie, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a Holocaust story, you know, it's hard to say how people would feel one way or the other, you know, if Steven Spielberg wasn't Jewish and was telling that story. But at the same time, you know, I tend to be more so of almost like that, the Atticus Finch school of you got to walk a mile in another man's shoes, you know, to really understand what they're about. You know, I, I feel that not just in reading diverse books, but if people want to write them and get the right kind of sensitivity read or you know, treat this with the utmost care or, you know, really do it justice, then, you know, I, per, my personal opinion is, you know, all the power to them. I mean, if someone, if someone did, you know, Schindler's List, the same kind of justice and it had the same kind of impactful message, then it would be great. But I think what sort of now happened is in this kind of, we're watching this kind of strange devolution of all this, you know, there, you know, it's not exactly a two-way street. There are a lot of people being told they can't write other people's experiences, which I think kind of becomes reductive because you can't, how can you tell a story when there's only one kind of person in your story, for instance? And I think a lot of the, the own voices thing, the diverse books thing, didn't really account for people who, you know, are not necessarily, don't as obviously, let's say, wear their diverse experience on their face, right? Mm -hmm. but I wrote about it in my article, like Jews have largely been able to blend into society. And so, you know, a lot of people feel like they've enjoyed a lot of the kinds of privileges other people have. while at the same time, you know, they've experienced a lot of atrocities. And when you get down to it, even though a lot of Jews have Western features, they have Middle Eastern roots and, and Middle Eastern features. And just because they look another way, you know, I felt that they shouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't, I don't want to say they were ignored from the diverse books movement, but I didn't get the impression that they were held in the same or as high a regard sometimes. And I think this, this kind of thing also comes about where, and it, you know, the WND people had to deal with this recently people who for instance let's say you're a man but in your heart you feel like you're a woman for whatever reason you know according to the logic of we need diverse books because you're really a man and you look like a man despite how you might feel in your heart those people because they're not wearing their experience the way other people are they're kind of excluded from from this movement and, and the privileges that go with it so they they've kind of changed that recently which I think is good you know they're, they they being more kind of open-minded to this stuff, which is really good. But it's had kind of a, a strange reaction for publishing, which you've probably seen too, I think, as a YA author. I don't know if you have thoughts about it too. You know, I completely, I agree. And I think it's really complicated because like, let's say, for example, I wanted to write a story about being a black person in America. As a white person, that would be really difficult, if not impossible to do. Going off my own experience, because like you don't have those experiences. You haven't been in those shoes. Right. Yeah, no, it makes people very uncomfortable. I mean, publishers, when they see that, they can't really work with a book like that. And even if you do get like a sensitivity read, it, you know, or let's say you find a co-author who's who's of that background, you know, it's very hard to do. You know, so we really do live in a time when, for instance, James Clavell could not have written Shogun. Yeah. I would say Mark Twain couldn't have really written Huckleberry Finn, despite, the, you know, positive messages of these books. Same thing with The Jungle Book, same thing with Gone with the Wind, you know, it, you know, even in recent years, Catherine Stockett and having written The Help. So it's, we're sort of like at a weird precipice in history. And, and I would much rather people understand one another, treat things like a meritocracy and really make stories about what they should be about, which is like the message of the story, the quality of the writing. And, and so the strange thing that's happening now in publishing is publishing 
publishers have like this insatiable appetite for diverse books. And it's sort of the way in which they've been buying a lot of debut fiction, because there's no track record to evaluate that an author on with debut fiction. What happens when they buy, you know, an author of debut fiction is so they shell out a lot of money, these publishers, not all these books live up to the expectation. It, it's kind of like betting on horses. And then it makes it immensely difficult for the author to do, you know, a second book with the publisher because the expectations are set way too high. They have to earn back a really big advance. They have to sell a lot of books to make it work. You know, it's kind of, it makes for a volatile market. It's not a, a real kind of practical business practice. And I feel like it's a similar thing with, if a publisher takes on an author who writes a diverse book, but, but it's extremely well written. The message of the story is great. It's an important book that needs to be published. Great. But if they're only taking it on the merit that, okay, it's written by a person of a diverse background, there's, it doesn't really hold a lot of water, even, even with readers. Not a good bet to make. Yeah. It's not a good bet to make. And so if publishers are just doing a lot of that, it's sort of the same thing as bet doing these, you know, six, seven, eight figure deals for these debut authors. A lot of it's not going to pan out. And I think a lot of it will kind of begin to, you know, kind of catch up with publishers. And then I think the other kind of spinoff from all this, which, you know, just watching this from where I am, I am in publishing and, you know, I just really want to get books sold. You know, it's, I'm not really interested in really propagating my opinion or, or, or usually putting it out there in the world. It's, it's it's one of the reasons why I don't really openly share my politics or anything like that, you know, or, or my, you know, anything like that. But a lot of this has led to just the cancellation of publications and, you know, this cancel culture and society is, is rampant. And it, and it, it scares me in a way because, you know, our country was founded on this this idea, you know, Voltaire, he said, you know, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Yeah. You know, he was one of these philosophers who, you know, inspired the founding fathers to make something possible in our country, like freedom of speech. And I think when, you know, the social media mob or whoever, or publishers or whoever's really deciding whether they're a gatekeeper, or whether they're you know, a person like with an angry person, you know, with a keyboard, you know, for people to, to like cancel people and cancel this cancel culture is, it's a scary thing because I think it begins to encroach upon freedom of speech. Really good example is you would think, okay, my last name is Gottlieb. I probably should hate the fact that, you know, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf is still in print, still being read in academic institutions, still widely known. Why is it important that that book is still in print. Why is it important that book is still published and known despite how terrible a person Hitler was? Because it's like what Jewish people say all the time. You know, go to any Holocaust memorial or exhibit, you're going to probably see the lines never again. Why never again? Because when you forget history, you're doomed to repeat it. And having these reminders out there in the world is is a reason to never repeat them. So when I see, for instance, in this country, you know, people tearing down Confederate monuments and things like that, those were terrible people. They were upholding terrible ideas, of course. You know, that's why we fought the Civil War. That's why I'm glad the North won. But the problem is, if you whitewash history, you forget it and you're doomed to repeat it. And that's why I feel like the correct thing is not necessarily, okay, not necessarily tear down the sculptures. I think the correct thing to do is, for instance, give the sculptures to the NAACP and say to the NAACP, listen, you can you can do what you want with a sculpture, but we would much rather you, you know, put a, a new plaque on the sculpture, recontextualize history for people today, explain why this, you know, Confederate general or whatever was wrong or a bad person or their example, example shouldn't be followed. You know, just because their statue exists doesn't mean, you know, they're suddenly a religious idol. You know, I think these things exist in history in our present day as, as kind of painful reminders of the past and reasons as to why we can, cannot repeat this stuff. That's that's why, you know, I don't want to say I'm a concerned citizen, but in seeing all this stuff, it makes me think and wonder about all of that and, and where we could, could be headed. It's important to, so I've researched for my own running the, the psychology behind genocide. The World War II, Rwanda, all these terrible events. Like, what was the mindset of the people who actually perpetrated them? And after reading these, that's one of the really scary things that I saw in a lot of 
society that wow we are like not far from from a horrible event like you can exactly see how these things happen you know just blaming people and erasing history or just getting rid of it for any reason that's oh, a big step it could happen again i mean we had a scary political climate recently and you know i never thought i would see some of that stuff but i knew when the pandemic came about that you know there was social unrest and and something would have to give so you know just because we have the internet today people have information in the palm of their hands you know anyone can say something and they you can dial it up on the internet and see whether or not you know the person's right or wrong whether the information you find is true or not is a, another matter because there's a lot of misinformation on the internet but in general people feel smarter and more informed today but a scary yeah, thing in itself it is because we don't no one r really has all the answers the more i know the the, the more i learn the, the less i you know or whatever you know the expression is but they're apart from coastal cities apart from you know places that have access to this stuff they're still very remote places you know not all of america is like new york and california i think people forget how big a country this is sometimes and like some sort of what a lot of the stuff can lead to but yes and it's like i remember a while ago was, there was a bunch of like asian hate things going on kind of at the beginning of the covid pandemic oh yeah i mean my girlfriend being korean she oh i was, can only imagine she was very scared and so were her friends i mean a couple of them were attacked in subways God. you know i remember seeing signs posted in subways to to keep people from you know harming other people because you know the spread of misinformation and and how it's like with jews people people were looking for a scapegoat when things were not going their way not going well you know in, in medieval europe the simple thing was well you know the country's in bad economic condition but the jews seem to have all the money because they're the money lenders that was a stepping stone for it. Yeah, and the Jews obviously were not money lenders by choice. It's one of the only jobs society would you know, allow for them to do because the church, you know, condo uh, condemned things like gambling and collecting interest on debts. So, yeah, I mean, it's a strange and interesting world. I don't know what else to it, say. It, it is. And, and, but I do think it is better to remember the, the things that happen. And that's why I think it is important for like book publishing, for example. There was a, The Children of Blood and Bone. Have you heard of that? It's a YA book. Of course. Yeah. It's a show on Netflix now. Really? That came out. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's on there. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be watching. I love that book. But it was just so, you know, this book is based off horrible real things that happened, but it blends culture and it does all these amazing things. And it's like, wow, this is like, this is a huge step forward for the genre itself and just recognizing both, you know, minority voices and also horrible things that happened historically. Well, when a story can can impart a really good and important message and do it well, that's, that's all that matters. You know, there's, it's even the same thing with, you know, there are writers who come across my desk who you know, they have MFAs, they've been publishing lit prestigious literary magazines and journals, they attended a really prestigious writer's workshop, or, you know, they have endorsements from like really, really, you know, big name, best-selling award-winning authors. But then you read the manuscript and you're like, wow, that, that's not so good. And <laughs> everything else just seems like it's bells and whistles now. Yeah. So, you know, to me, yeah, I mean, diversity is really important. We need diverse books. We need diverse voices, but I don't think it should come at the cost of quality storytelling and important storytelling that carries like an important message, you know? So it's, yeah, that's, that's sort of my only hope when it comes to that, you know, as it pertains to, you know, the, my blog article and Jewish people, I would say for Jewish people, I think they're kind of largely, you know, misunderstood because there are a lot of people consider them white passing. They've been, and therefore have been, they've enjoyed a lot of privileges, but at the same time, they've been disenfranchised in a lot of other ways. And at its heart, it goes back to, you know, Judaism as a, you know, ethnocentric religion. Judaism is not just a religion. It's, it's a, it's a culture. It's a people, you know, there's a country with a flag. So yeah, it just, it concerns me a little bit. And that, and especially that given the tense political environment, you know, between Israel and Palestine, and again, people looking for scapegoats when I saw there were, <clears throat> and even amidst, you know, all the stop Asian hate, which, you know, I'm sympathetic to the plight of those people. I told you my, my girlfriend is Korean, you know, I have Korean friends and etc. I mean, but when I saw that what was going on, these hate crimes in, in New York and California, you know, against Jewish people and that protest is not getting the same kind of media attention that stop Asian hate was. It didn't get like any in New York whenever that it was didn't. happening. It didn't. And then, and then, 
you know, you started to see on writers and the New York Times, finally, they perked up and they said, you know what, you're right. It didn't get the, the right kind of attention. It didn't get the same kind of attention. So, yeah, I it's think... like you get the worst end of the stick. It's like, you know, you're minority, but you're also, you're white. You're treated like a minority. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, well, it's like, yes, I am, but you're saying I'm not because they just, you know, they look at you and they say white skin. They see the white skin. Ah, oh, you must be a white person. But it's like, no, 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 we're not. And we're not being treated that way either. Yeah. And so the, my article really went to the heart of the fact that people can, without looking diverse, feel diverse in their heart or be diverse in their heart and should be treated as such with, with a lot of the same privileges, I think, you know, I mean, certainly for for Jewish people is, is how I felt, but I'm, I'm sure, and I don't want to speak for other folks, but I think, you know, it could apply for other to other people and other groups. And I, I do think they came around to that. I feel like it really has to do a lot with kind of the integrity intent. I mean, like, let's say Schindler's List. Let's say it was written by, by just a white European guy. But man, they did the research. They did history. They like were passionate about this and tried so hard to do this historically and fair and just the best story as realistically they could. Well, should they be condemned for that? Because like they're bringing forward this wonderful piece of you know, media. You know, people historically have written other people's narratives, and these books, a lot of them, had good messages and went on to become classics, which were read in school, although mm -hmm. a lot of them now are being canceled. You know, honestly, if someone does a people, a story, justice, you know, with a good message, I think that's that's what it really boils down to. It's like Abraham Lincoln, he, he said, he said, when I do good, I feel, well, he said, when I I do bad, I feel bad. And when I do good, I feel good, he said. And that is my religion. Very simple. It's, it makes it positive, negative, black and white. Like if if you're a good person, you're doing good in the world, great. And if you're not, then you're not, not functioning in the right kind of way. And I feel like the same thing, it goes to stories. Like if you're telling a story, you're doing the right thing, you're spreading a positive message and making the world a better place, then, then all the power to you. And you're building on that. I mean, imagine... So let's say a book just isn't written by a diverse author, but it's a diverse story. I mean, wouldn't it be a shame to have this beautiful, diverse story that very likely these diverse people would love to read and just be happy that they're, you know, being recognized? Sure. And have that be canceled or not be published because it's like, no, you're you're hurting diversity at that point, trying to protect it. Well, it's hard to be a reed in the river, but, and these aren't my decisions, you know, I mean, as agents, you know, in working at a literary agency like I do, you know, we, we just want to sell books. We want to see books get published. Yeah. We're not about, you know, barring people from getting published or any of that. Like, our work is commission-based, so if an author does well, we in turn do well. You know, the decisions usually are up to publishers and ultimately, readers, you know, how well a book does or doesn't do. And so I never really have an opinion in the matter, but I'm merely a conduit. Although I can say that, you know, if I know that, you know, an author comes to me and they've written someone else's background or experience, it's going to be hard to sell that book because of the attitudes that publishers have, which is really unfair toward people. So sometimes when I see promise in the story, I'll say to the author, you know, hey, maybe you want to get a sensitivity read on this. Like, you know, if you've written about like the Ojibwe tribe, get a chieftain to read your book, maybe write a paragraph or two about how, nope, the story is correct. It's culturally sensitive. sensitive. It, it, it uh, paints my people in a good light. Or sometimes I say to people, you know, maybe you want to go as far as to, you know, pair up with a writer or illustrator, whatever the kind of book is, who, you know, is of that background and can help in, inform your writing in, in many better ways because frankly, it will lower a lot of barriers to entry in, in working with publishers. It makes their story so much, it will make your story better. It's not going to make you worse to do any of that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's it's reasonable. Otherwise, you know, I, I know an author, they'll remain unnamed, but, you know, they had said to me, I'm lucky I got published when I did. I said, why is that? And he said, because it's never been a worse time to be a, a straight white man in book publishing. And I had to laugh at that because, you know, even though straight white men have enjoyed a lot of privileges like right now <laughs> it's not looking so good uh -huh. for, like 
you know, it's much, much harder because of the needs of the marketplace and, and how all this has reshaped the world. But ultimately, I don't think these are people who are going around and, I mean, this is, I always say, this is book publishing. This is not the RNC or something like that. I mean, people are pretty liberal and left-minded for the most part in book publishing. Mm -hmm. So they're not really, tend not to as much anyway, propagate so many other ideas. You know, it's not like someone's going to write about, for instance, Hispanic people and then make it it a racist tirade and hope to get that book published. No. <laughs> Although technically Hitler did that with Jewish But that was different. It was that, that was different. That was a different time. But my point is now, these are people who just want to tell stories mm. and who want to write books. And to me, it's just about freedom of speech. It's one of the reasons, for instance, why you know, not a lot of people know this, but the KKK is allowed to march on Washington every year. Now, why mm. would the KKK be allowed to do that when a lot of people feel the KKK spreads messages of hate, they inc incite violence, you know, it really borders on you know, that what people always say about freedom of speech, you know, there are limitations to freedom of speech. It comes with license. You can't, you know, yell fire in a movie theater or something like that. But the reason why the KKK is afforded that freedom, it's organizations that fought for them to have the right to do that. Liberal or organizations who fought for them to have the right to do that. Why? Because when you begin to limit freedom of speech, you know, it's a slippery slope. Like you take away the KKK freedoms of freedoms of speech, great, okay, I'm not for the KKK, but then who's next? And then who's next? And then as it yeah. becomes a giant snowball, and before you know it, you know we're in a a propaganda society where maybe almost like what they have in China, where the government completely controls every freedom of speech, the internet, everything you say, and suddenly you, you've given up a lot of rights. It's, you, you cannot take this stuff for granted is what's really important. I mean, I was, I was once talking with a friend who grew up in Russia. They lived through the communist era. They lived through the fall of communism and to today. And, you know, I was going on about, oh, America's so great. We're free. We have freedom of speech, you know. And she said, really? You think that? The fact that you think think that makes you really naive because, you know, you take it all for granted. You just because you think you have this stuff doesn't mean you actually do. And it's the same thing with what's going on in publishing. People think these are very forward ideas, think a good thing is happening. And it is in a lot of ways, but it's also, you know, an encroachment in a lot of ways on the freedom of speech. It is, it's a good, it's a double-edged sword, I have to say. It's a really good thing in a lot of ways, but it also begins to limit people's freedom of speech. Like with, say, How to Kill a Mockingbird. Imagine if that had not been published. That is a huge book in the history of America. And that oh. that was made, it, that that's a thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very, very hard to do today. And I think a lot of this came about because we're basically today, we're trying to unpack and live with, you know, all the ripple effects that have come back to bite us, you know, from, you know, from our history, you know, yeah. America has a dark past. It's not, not free of all, all this stuff. The same way Germany has, you know, a dark past and, you know, but they really own it. You know, in Germany, they don't whitewash this stuff and they, they no. have Holocaust monuments and they don't try and disprove the existence of the Holocaust and things like that. They recognize these horrible events so that it will never happen again. Yeah. And I think that's the key. That's a big part of this. Like when I see, for instance, for instance, there was a TV show which, you know, you have to look at things for what they were, not for what they are today, but there was a TV show called The Little Rascals, which... It was a black and white show about kids living in the depression. And there were a couple of characters in the show which were black. And a lot of people in the black community did not like how they were portrayed. And so Whoopi Goldberg bought the rights to the show just to take it off air. Like, I, I can understand that. Like, if there was a show like, or if there was a play like William Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, which portrays Jews in a negative light, I wouldn't want to go and burn the play. I would want to hold, I would want to hold this in front of people's face like a mirror and say, do you, do you really like what you see? Do you really like today in our modern age, how Jews were being portrayed? You know, if I just had something like that evaporate and then that kept on happening again and again, and my attitude in my mind was, well, every time that happens again and again, I'm just going to try and make it evaporate. No, I think people, people need to look in the mirror and if they don't like what they see, then they need to do something about it. Then they know what they need to do. Just because uh, you take it away doesn't, you didn't stop it. What the people felt 
when they're watching this. It's right. like you, you didn't actually change them at all. You just took it away. So now somebody will probably meet its supply and demand. They had a demand for it. Somebody will fill it. But you need to show them, hey, this is why this is not okay. You shouldn't yeah. be doing this. And I don't think people are misinformed or, or misguided for the most part necessarily. I think it's like goes back to that Abraham Lincoln thing. People mm -hmm. just do know the difference between right and wrong. I think in the deep, deep down inside, it just needs to be elicited sometimes. But people are scared and, you know, they're informed by fear. And whenever you're informed by fear, you make bad decisions. And the internet has kind of amplified that for people because, you know, it's out there in the world. People the democratization of the internet has given everyone a voice and it's created this mob. And so people who work in publishing houses who just want to publish good books, you know, are sometimes afraid to publish them in the right way or, or whatever because of what the reaction might be. And they have a job. At the end of the day, they need to put food on the table. You know, they've got kids, they've got a mortgage. They just, they just want to get by, keep their head down, you know? So I think you, you know, you throw all that kind of stuff into the mix and, the, and you get a weird result yeah it's it's a business at the end of the day that's what well, it, it's books but it is a business that's true before yeah. I let you go. You know, we have, I have this community of writers, over 60,000 writers. Many of them are querying. We see these questions all the time in the group. Do you have one piece of a piece of a querying advice you might want to give them? Uh, querying advice, I would say just, you really got to make for a well-written query letter because frankly, that is your first window for everyone into quality of your writing. And for that very reason, it's why you need to grab someone's attention immediately, I would say, in the first line or two, just because people's inboxes are inundated and stuff like that. So I think that's the best thing writers can ultimately do is really refine that hook in their query letter, make it extremely well-written and enticing such that we want to request the manuscript after reading a query letter. Thank you so much for your time. This has been an amazing conversation. Awesome. Likewise, I, uh, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for organizing this. And yes, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're taking good care that you'll be all, all right over there on that coast. I'd love to have you on, again on the show sometime. So we should definitely try to make this happen again. Sure, I would love for that. Yeah, any way that you know, I'm always about helping writers, making for a good writing community, providing the best resources that I can. You know, it's, it's, it's really why I do this. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you again. Bye. All right, be well. Bye-bye.